Good morning. I would like to invite all participants to come into the meeting room in order for us to start the opening ceremony of the conference. Good morning, all participants, delegates, distinguished guests and scholars, keynote speakers, uh, representative of the key organizer of the conference. Welcome to Chiang Mai University. For those of you who come here for the very first time, welcome to the cool, fragrant morning breeze of Chiang Mai. And for those of you who come regularly, welcome back again. Uh, this, uh, this international conference today is uh, the, the international conference jointly organized by the Asia-Pacific Sociological Association in collaboration with the Faculty of Social Science, Chiang Mai University. And it is organized in timely conjunction with the 50th anniversary of the Faculty of Social Science, which is one of the oldest faculty of Chiang Mai University. So the building we are here today is the Faculty of Humanities. We have another conference uh, which is held in parallel with this international conference at the Faculty of Social Science in Thai language. All participants are invited to join in both conference. Uh, as all the key representatives and all the um, uh, CMU and uh, the Sociological Association representative and chair of the opening ceremonies are here. I would like to invite Dr. Chiyan Watanaputi, the chair of the opening ceremonies, vice president of Chiang Mai University, Professor Wachara Kasindra, the dean of the faculty of social science, Chiang Mai University, associate professor Puang Pet Thanasin, and the president of the uh, Asia Pacific Sociological Association, Professor Rujira Gengulis Grace, uh, uh, to come onto the stage for the opening ceremony. Please welcome. Good morning, uh, and it is my immense pleasure to welcome all of you at this uh, 12th Asia-Pacific Sociological Association Conference, which is organized in conjunction with the celebration of the 50th anniversary uh, of the Faculty of Social Sciences at Chiang Mai University. Thank you for coming to the conference and please <coughs> accept our apologies for the inconvenience due to slow process of registration downstairs. Uh, because of the great number of the participants that we expected and the limited capacity of the elevators to bring all of you up to the eighth floor. <laughs> Sorry. <coughs> uh, I should also mention that this conference, of course, uh, it's organized uh, by local organizers, Chiang Mai University, uh, it, <coughs> but they, we also receive great support from the National Research Council of Thailand, the Sociology uh, Division, uh, the Siamese Association of Sociologists and Anthropologists of Thailand, Chula Global Network, Chula, Chula Longkorn University, and the Asia Pacific Intellectual Fellowship Program. So there are several 
organization, international organization, academic international, academic institution, jointly organize this wonderful workshop. Because of the tight program of the first day of the conference, allow me to start the first session of the conference, the welcoming ceremony. It is our honor to request Professor Vachara Kasimberg, the Vice President of Chiang Mai University for Academic Affairs, to deliver a welcome speech and uh, on behalf of Chiang Mai University. Please, Mr. Vice President. President of Asia Pacific Sociological Association, President of National Research Council of Thailand, Director of Jura Global Network, Jura Longkorn University, Director of Regional Center for Social Science and Sustainable Development, Distinguished Speakers, Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. I would like to welcome all of you to Chiang Mai. We are at Chiang Mai University. Feel very, very honored to be host of this conference, the Asia Pacific Sociological Association Conference on Transforming Societies, Contestations, and Convergence in Asia and the Pacific. In conjunction with the 50th anniversary of the Faculty of Social Science, Chiang Mai University. Chiang Mai University has long been involved in research in Asia and the Pacific, particularly focused on the Asian region. I see that our conference is timely as during the recent decade. We have witnessed dramatic transformation of society and economy in the region. In Southeast Asia, we have seen different degrees and speeds of development, industrialization, transnationalization, connectivity, and people mobility. Yet in this region, we have also experienced economic equality, unequal society, conflict, displacement, and dislocation. It is significant to revisit and reflect upon the complex changes and social transformation taking place since the past five decades. It is also important to formulate a consensus on a research and inquiry direction among scholars from different parts of the world who have worked on researching Asia and the Pacific. The, lat the latter uh, recently becoming our counterpart on behalf of Chiang Mai University, I would like to thank the Regional Center of Social Science and Sustainable Development and Social Science faculty staff for organizing this academic meeting, supporting Chiang Mai University to become an active intellectual place that incorporates and generates wisdom. We would like to thank the Asia Pacific Sociological Association, Jura Global Network, Jura Lungkan University, and the Faculty of Social Science, Chiang Mai University, for their financial support. Finally, I would like to take this opportunity to declare the conference open and to wish all of you great success, generating fruitful exchange and discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Professor Machara, the Vice President of Chiang Mai University. Now, I would like to invite Professor Ruchira Gankulis-Kras, 
to welcome the participants. Professor Rujira is the president of the Asia Pacific Sociological Association, who has trust at Fujima University to organize this conference. And I hope that uh, we can deliver what we promise. Thanks very much. Uh, APSA members, distinguished guests, conference delegates, and ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of the Asia Pacific Sociological Association, I'd like to extend a very warm welcome to you all. APSA is, <coughs> excuse me, is unique in the sense that it represents sociologists in the region and it's the only pan-Asian association of sociologists affiliated to the International Sociological Association. So we're delighted to have the opportunity to hold this conference at Chiang Mai University. And I'm particularly grateful to Dr. Chayan Vatanaputi, chair of the uh, conference and his team also for organizing and hosting the conference at Chiang Mai University. At the last biennial co conference, I had raised the possibility of the conference being held in Thailand with Professor Surichai, and he was very kind in facilitating and lending support at every step of the way. It's also apt that a regional association such as APSA should join in the Golden Jubilee celebration of the Faculty of the Social Sciences at Chiang Mai University. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank the Dean Faculty of Social Sciences, and please forgive my pronunciation, Professor Huang Pech Danashin, um, and Vice President of the University, Professor Wachara Kasin Sendrik, sorry again, for their support in bringing the conference into fruition. Um, as has been pointed out, the diverse range of themes of topics from several hundred um, uh, presenters are indicative of the vibrant nature of sociology in the region. APSA 2014 promises to be an interesting and exciting event. Uh, you've already seen the schedule of papers. Many of the papers deal with difficult challenges facing the Asia Pacific, such as the issues of transnationalism and migration, urbanization, industrialization and the precariat, precariat. More importantly, APSA continues to confront and critique conventional theories and conventional wisdom of mainstream sociological perspectives. I've been a member of this association since its inception in 1996 at the very first APSA conference held in Manila. At that time, as an early career researcher, one of the things that attracted me to uh, APSA was its dynamic and comparative focus. Very often, sociology remains a prisoner of its past in the sense that the discipline has had the nation state um, as the unit of analysis. Yet in a globalized world, this is no longer viable. In fact, one of the important collective achievements of APSA members has been the publication of a couple of volumes that addresses the nuance global local interconnections. Having said that, however, many accounts of the Asia Pacific societies continue to be Euro American <coughs> sociology transplanted in a local setting. This certainly presents limitations and fails to note the local subtleties and historical realities. Fortunately, a number of sociologists in Asia have challenged these Eurocentrism and brought to the fore significant post-colonial perspectives. We are very privileged to have presentation at the present and past conferences from a number of scholars who've been at the forefront of such debates. A contemporary sociology of the Asia Pacific therefore needs to go beyond the Eurocentrism 
of its theorization and take into account the complex macro and micro interrelationships. The opportunity for us to work from the ground up is there for the taking. Many papers in this conference are rooted in the empirical tradition that aims to interrogate the local realities. I urge all of you to exchange your ideas, theoretical perspectives, and walk, sorry, work together, and walk together also, <laughs> towards building genuine comparative Asia-Pacific sociologies. It is important for us to engage in and celebrate the diversity of lived experiences and identities, and at the same time, continue to critique the forms of inequalities of gender, class, race, ethnicities, age hierarchies, and sexual orientations. I don't wish to take much more of your time other than to say uh, and pay tribute to the founding president of APSA, Professor John Weston. Professor Weston, together with a number of senior sociologists in the region, including Professor Corazon Lamug and Professor Kenji Korsaka, inspired and mentored a whole generation of sociologists. It has been my privilege to serve APSA in various capacities for the past 18 years. It's really important to carry on the legacy of Professor Weston's vision, and I urge young sociologists to take it in a new direction in a new century. The future belongs to the young sociologists. It belongs to you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Lucia, for your profound uh, welcome speech and the introduction of the APSA as an organization. Uh, you are comments on the themes and various sub-themes of our conference issue to be taken will, will be uh, <coughs> helpful for the participant to discuss and exchange with you in the approximately about 50 panels of our conference. Now, it's also my privilege to introduce the Dean of Social Sciences, Professor Wong Hit Anasi, to welcome the participants and especially our alumni who have come to join us for the celebration of the 50th anniversary of our faculty. Please, Professor Wong Hit. Thank you. Good morning, dear Professor Dr. Wasala Gasinova, Vice President of Chiang Mai University, Professor Rujira. President of Asia Pacific Sociological Association, EPSA, President of National Research Council of Thailand, Director of Jula Global Network, Jula Longkorn University, Dr. Shiyan Watanaputi, Director of Regional Sa Center for Social Science and Sustainable Development, Ms. Dawsing Lola Pai, distinguished guests, participants, ladies and gentlemen, Faculty of S Social Science, Chiang Mai University, has established since 1964. It was one of the first three faculties of Chiang Mai University. Since then, it has expanded substan substantially in terms of teaching, research, community service, and other academic activities. At present, the faculty of social science, the faculty members are specialized in social science disciplines, including geography, sociology, anthropology, development studies, women studies, health, social science, and political economy. The faculty consists of four departments and one center, Department of Geography, Department of Sociology and Anthropology, Department of Women Studies, Department of Social Science and Development, and Center for Research and Academic Service. In the faculty, we also have the research centers, namely Regional Center for Social Science and Sustainable Development, or RCSD, Sustainable Land Use <coughs> and Natural Resource Management <coughs> Academic Center, Center for Ethnic <coughs> Studies and Development, 
Biodiversity and Indigenous Knowledge Study Center for Research and Sustainable Development, and Geoinformatics and Space Technology Center Northern Region. Most of them collaborate their works on the research projects and other academic activities with other international institutions and universities. And at present, our faculty offer undergra four undergrad programs, 14 graduate programs, and three doctoral programs, focusing on social science subject, development study, and action in particular. Today, I am really delighted to be part of this commemorative meeting and proud to be at forefront of the debates and discussions on change and transformation in Asia Pacific and our region especially. The collaboration to organize this conference is a significant turn showing our well-established academic network and determine research direction in the near future. We hope that this collaboration will be the good start for the Faculty of Social Science to become a leading place in this transnational academic community and for the faculty staff to practice on social research, teaching, and academic activities on the challenging issues that recently occur and continue in Southeast Asia and Asia Pacific region. Thank you everyone for coming and participating in this auspicious moment, which sees the launching of this significant collaboration. Hope you have present stay with us. Thank you. Thank you, Dean Pompet. Uh, now, please allow me to spend a few minutes saying something about this conference and our expectation. First, we regret that uh, a few participants from Indonesia cannot join us this, for this conference because their flight to Bangkok was canceled due to the volc volcano dust. Uh, we have been noticed that the last video that a few, there are some cancellation of the participation of the participant and speakers. Uh, however, according to my last count yesterday or this morning, we still have a large number of participants, probably about 460 participants to, to uh, this conference uh, and some of them may sitting in the room outside because this room are filled and maybe some of them are still coming this afternoon. Uh, I would like to report to you that the chair and the vice president and me that these, in this conference there are participants from 98 universities plus uh, 15 or more uh, independent institutions. So this may be the first time for our university particularly the Faculty of Social Sciences to host large participants, large number of participants from so many universities from various parts of the world. Second, uh, the conference under the theme of trans, transforming, transforming society, contestation and conversion in the in Asia and the Pacific is, is being organized into two parts. The, the English part, the, the APSA International Conference is, is held at this building. And another conference which will commence in the afternoon and run parallel to our conference is organized at the Faculty of Social Science opposite to this room. But of course, all participants uh, are welcome to both buildings. Please do enjoy the exhibition in, at both uh, buildings, uh, book launching, um, uh, film screenings, and reception, etc., etc. <coughs> Third, uh, the theme of uh, this conference, uh, as you have noticed, we have repeated several times, transforming society, contestation, and convergence. This idea and the details sub themes uh, <coughs> were developed in, together by Professor Suri Chai and Professor Ambong from Malaysia and myself. But of course, uh, these themes need to be elaborated. And of course,
challenge me as Professor Ruchirai has, has mentioned that we need to, to question the Western sociological paradigm that we have been uh, sort of importing to our, our own sociology, our own research. Uh, but I, I also would like to say that uh, <clears throat> when we talk about transforming societies, we need to talk more about the context in which these transformations uh, taking place. And of course, uh, I'm sorry, I'm an anthropologist, not a sociologist. <laughs> we are interested in, in, we are interested in people. In other words, uh, we are asking whether the transformation or the transforming of our society would benefit all or just benefit some people. So, <clears throat> We would like to bring bring in or bring back people into this con conceptualization of uh, transforming society, contestation, and and uh, convergence. But of course, I am not the one who <coughs> chartered the discussion and the exchange, the orientation of this uh, uh, conference. I would leave the the task to our keynote speakers today and tomorrow to <clears throat> help us to be able to conceptualize, reflect upon, and discuss about what are the key issues in this uh, transforming society. What we are, the, the, the phenomena that we are witnessing I would like also to mention that uh, we have several joining, jointly uh, well, have organizers and organizations that help us to run to organize this conference, but the one common denominator of these associations and, and organizations is Professor Suri Chai Nakel from Sri Lanka University. He just walked out from the meeting. Oh, he's over there. Oh, he's over there. Thank you, Professor Suri Chai Wankel. In fact, in fact, I am his speed guru. Okay, thank you very much, uh, the, the Vice President, the Dean, and the President of APSA. So now I would leave the microphone to our uh, Dr. Mudawan to moderate. Thank you very much. Dr. Shayan, Professor Bachara, Professor Rujira, and uh, Associate Professor Fong Thet. Uh, Professor Bachara, uh, could you please remain on the stage? Uh, Professor uh, Rujira as well, please remain on the stage. Uh, we would like to, uh, to invite Professor Bachara to give a token of appreciation to the President of EPSA, Professor Rujira. Thank you very much, uh, the Vice President, Professor Bashara, and the President of EPSA. Uh, before we proceed to the next schedule, uh, we would like to have a group uh, se photo session uh, of all the uh, speakers who give the very warm welcoming speech for us today. Um, Dr. Shiyan, Dr. Shiyan, Professor Bashara, Associate Professor Pung Thet and, uh, and Professor Rutira, please uh, come up again for the photo session.
thank you very much uh, for the key representative of CNU and EPSA. Uh, without further ado, I think this is the time that we have been waiting for uh, our keynote uh, speech for today's morning. Uh, I would like to, this, this is a great honor for the Faculty of Social Science and the organizer of the committee to introduce you to one of our keynote speakers for today, Do Sengro Lapai. Do Sengro Lapai is a member of the ethnic uh, Kachin people, and she, ha she has been awarded with the prestigious Ramon Magsaysay Award for the, two, uh, for the year 2013. Uh, Do Sengro Lapai has been working in many countries, uh, almost a decade in Germany, uh, in Bangkok, before she returned to work in humanitarian and development, as well as in the peace process building in uh, Myanmar or Burma. Uh, she has been the co-founder of the Meta Development Foundation, which has been engaged in lots of uh, livelihood project activities, from agriculture to education, early childhood education, to health healthcare project, as well as other livelihood project. Uh, the Meta Development Foundation under the leadership, under the 13 year of leadership of Do Seng Ro La Pai has become the largest uh, civil society, non-government organization in that country, Myanmar. And it has reached over 600,000 people uh, over, who live in over 2,000 communities in Myanmar. So without further ado, I would like you to welcome our keynote speaker for today, this morning, Do Seng Ro La Pai, please. you all this morning at this international conference reflecting on the intricacies of affecting social transformation in the Asia Pacific region. It is also an honor to be present at the occasion of 50th anniversary of Faculty of Social Science, Chiang Mai University. I apologize, I will not be able to time with you at this auspicious moment, but I wish you all the best for the two-day celebration, and I hope my small contribution will complement it in some way. As Dr. Muktawan mentioned in my introduction, I'm a, Mya I'm a Kachin ethnic minority from Myanmar, and the recipient of 2013 Raman Mak Sai Sai Award. My award citation says, my quote, quietly inspiring and inclusive leadership in the midst of deep, deep ethnic divides and prolonged armed conflict to regenerate and empower damaged communities and to strengthen local NGOs in promoting a non-violent culture of participation and dialogue as the foundation for Myanmar's peaceful future, unquote. I just want to add that my good friend Mart has said, he agrees with all the aspects of the citation, except for the quietly bit. This is just to give you a heads up that uh, I will be very open and will not be all that quiet today. I will 
will try to address the realities on the ground. I was a bit apprehensive when first approached about giving this address as it would set the tone for this two-day event. I only accepted when Ajahn Chayan assured me that I would not be expected to give an academic talk. So I will be drawing mainly from my own experiences in talking about the hopes and fears, the challenges and opportunities that we, the peoples of Myanmar, face at this time of unprecedented change in our country. The title I have chosen for my keynote address is Transforming Societies in Myanmar, the Dynamics of Conflict and Cooperation. I use societies to highlight the need to move away from the tendency of focusing on the majority ethnic group at the expense of the minority ethnic societies. This long-standing myopia has contributed to the great divide in Myanmar society along ethnic lines. Also, I will be referring to the majority ethnic group of our country as Bama. I beg for my fellow countrymen's indulgence if they should find the term Bama too colloquial or disrespectful. I use it only to avoid confusion with the country name Myanmar. The other ethnic nationals will be referred to as the major sorry, minority. Minority is used simply to indicate that they are fewer in numbers, not to imply deficiency in any other way. I hope for your understanding. I will call my country Myanmar because it has been so from the very beginning, P Town Su Myanmar Nanga, Union of Myanmar. At this juncture, whether we say Burma or Myanmar, the content is the same, the same to me. Name change, flag change, and the planned ceremonious signing of nationwide ceasefire, all are empty if they do not signify actu actual milestones of progress. To quote from the Christmas message from Bishop Charles Poe, the Archdiocese of Yangon, name without content is empty. We need a name that is married to the dreams. The bishop's message is clear. We have yet to make our dreams converge into one vision and transform it to reality. On finding out that the land size of Myanmar is equal to that of Thailand and Cuba combined, it dawned on me that there is a lot we can learn from these two countries. I lived in Thailand for seven years before accompanying some 10,000 Pachin refugees from China to return home and rebuild their lives. The experience and lessons learned while living as a foreigner in Thailand serve as the motivation behind my desire to return and work in my country, compromising where necessary, crossing thin lines certainly, showing no aggression, being respectful to all, are some values of my host country that I have tried to adopt to the very best of my ability. Whatever success I have today streams from me. And my special gratitude to Ajahn Sulak Savaraksa. Sulak was among the first Thais to respond to the needs of the new arrivals at the border in the aftermath of the 88 uprising. On looking back, I realized it is acts of kindness like Sulak's that raised my own consciousness to put passion and energy into a cause that is not necessarily of one's own country or people. It is my great privilege to be acquainted with such a personage. Our country is fortunate in, in that it attracts such committed, good-hearted individuals, and it is because of them that we are where we are today. Even today, I have discovered another lesson from your country. Please bear
bear with me if I'm politically incorrect here. But I hope so much that our countrymen, especially the Burma, the majority, the elites, learn from your experience the pitfalls of prioritizing Bangkok at the expense of rural people from the borderlands who sidelined at the expense and neglected, who sidelined and neglected, become more open to populist appeals. In the Myanmar context, these rural people are the ethnic nationals, the co-founders of the union, marginalized and excluded from the decision-making process, take up arms to make their voices heard. The upshot of years of armed conflict in ethnic regions is uneven distribution of wealth and lack of access to education. This has the potential of making minorities more susceptible to the false promises and short-term development offers of government cronies and foreign companies out to further their own economic interests. And yes, we the minority, the non burma ethnic nationals, must also learn from Thailand that it is high time that we seek to cultivate the Burma majority support in our cause and march our respective goals into one. The success of the Save the AFG campaign is just such an example. The fight to stop construction of a major dam on the AFG confluence was first initiated by the Kachins at the upper reaches of the river. But when the devastating consequences of such a dam caught nationwide attention, concerned citizens from all walks of life and ethnic city joined hands to launch the campaign that compelled the president to suspend construction during his term of office. Also, I would be remiss if I do not acknowledge that the commitment of ordinary Burma citizens who have rallied in support for peace in the Kachin region and relief for Kachins displaced by the war. As for Cuba, we all know that like our country, Myanmar, Cuba was governed by 50 five years by one man, Fidel Castro, and now his brother Raul. They too have huge economic problems, but a very big difference is that the Castro regime emphasizes education and healthcare, so that standards in these sectors are very high. Whereas Cuba exports doctors to other Latin American countries, our own educated people is key to other countries that recognize their values. This you know, as many such people are with you. But Cuba also faces the same challenge as we do, mainly the role of the military in the country's political life. So the question arises, what, in the Myanmar context, is the role of the military, or the Tamajo, as it is known in Burmese. First, let's consider the official stated role of the Tamajo. The three main objectives of the Tamajo, as summed up by Senior General Mi Aulai, Commander-in-Chief of the Defense Services in his Armed Forces Day speech last, last year, <coughs> are non-disintegration of the Union, non-disintegration of national, <coughs> <excuse me. coughs> national solidarity and perpetuation of sovereignty. Then we have Article 340 of the 2008 Constitution of the Republic of the Union of Myanmar, which states, with the approval of the National Defense and Security Council, the Defense Services has the authority to administer the participation of the entire people in the security and defense of the Union. The strategy of the People's Malaysia shall be carried out under the leadership of the Defense Services. There can be no
no dispute that in present-day Myanmar, the role of the Tamador is not simply confined to national defense. The Tamador is currently the most powerful single bloc in parliament, with 25% seats held directly by military personnel and a further 52% held by the military-backed Union Solidarity and Development Party. This gives the Tamador, in essence, absolute legislative control, as Section 436 in the Constitution stipulates that constitutional amendments can only be made by a vote of more than 75% of all the representatives of Parliament or the Pitao Sulutjo, as it is known in Burmese. Also of serious concern is the very structure of the state in which military spending is estimated to take up as much as 21% of the national budget. Added to this is the burden borne by communities in ethnic regions for the upkeep of non-state military groups and the People's Militias created by the Tamadol to further expand military control over contested territories and act as counters to ethnic opposition forces. As long as conflict continues, maintaining these forces will be a drain on local finances and communities. All ungrouped should do well to take note that provisioning their troops with local supplies invariably incites the people against them, as evidenced by the end results of Napoleon's strategy of living off the land during the early 19th century Peninsular War that led to his downfall. In the face of all these complexities, transitioning the present Tamador into a more inclusive federal army as envisioned by 17 ethnic resistance organizations presents itself as an attractive, viable alternative. Major General Gunmar, Deputy Chief of the Kachin Independence Army and a key negotiator in peace talks with the government and incidentally, Myanmar's 2013 Person of the Year in an online survey conducted by Democratic Voice of Burma had this to say when asked on the topic in a recent interview with the AFD magazine. Quote, what we want is a Tamador that includes all nationalities because all, we all live in this country together. That is why we are calling for a federal union army. But how to transform the current Tamador is something that we have to discuss with everyone concerned. President Thein Sein's monthly radio address on February 1st, urging lawmakers to take into account the demand of ethnic armed groups in any future constitutional amendments, is reason to hope that the involvement of the Tamador into a more ethnically integrated military can become a reality once a strong federal structure is in place. A good model for such a force would be the British Armed Forces with its proven track record of integrating different national contingents like the Irish, Gorkha, and others from Commonwealth countries under one command. In fact, I really believe the UK is in a very good position to enable this process as it is currently engaging with the Tamadon, providing training aimed to expose future senior officers to new thinking and encourage the Tamadon to prepare for a new role. That's a quote from the UK Foreign Office in recent visit to Yangon. So in this centennial year of the outbreak of uh, World War I, I would like to challenge the British government to commit to this cause in commemoration of the Kachins, Chins, and Karens who served and fought violently side by side for the British Empire in the Mesopotamian 
campaign and for the Allied cause in World War II. Resource sharing is another contentious issue in our country. Myanmar is a resource-rich country, and government revenues come chiefly from selling office resources found mainly in ethnic minority states. As a result, one large and growing barrier to peace in our country is the resource trade. There is bound to be conflict when the government acts arbitrarily in garnering the country's natural resources, leaving out local populations in the cold. The inequity in resource sharing, the land grabbing, and environmental destruction that accompany resource extraction have further exacerbated the act remoning that already exists over political inequality. The UN Human Rights Rapporteur, Mr. Quintana, whose visit to Yakai in August 2013 coincided with the local people's call for resource sharing had this to say, quote, addressing the issue of undevelopment and poverty, including the sharing benefits from the state's natural resources with local inhabitants must be considered as vital to finding solutions to the crisis in Yakai state. The Yakines simply wanted to know what they, as the locals, would get from all the resource trade in their region. It is only natural that they should want a certain amount of local autonomy, budgeting, authority in education and legislation to develop their own communities and state. This call of the Yakine represents that of all that of all other states, Shen, the Chen, Shan, Karen, Bia, and Mon. In short, it is important that as our country presses on to resolve a myriad of underlying political difficulties and grievances, it should not be allowed to sidestep resource sharing issues. I would like to quote Bishop Charles Bo again here. Quote, but we are afraid afraid that things are going on as usual. The people and the cronies who benefited last 20 years are the major beneficiaries once again. The real estates, new agreements with the foreign companies, the desire to loot and load the resources, it looks like business as usual. The blood and the sacrifice and hundreds of thousands who died a silent death yesterday so that the Myanmar of tomorrow may be just and equitable, that blood and sacrifice might be destroyed in the darkness of new greed of the old cronies. Shall we keep silent?" Unquote. We assure you, Bishop, we have not been silent. Indeed, since 2011, the Myanmar people have been more emboldened to come out and use their rights to demonstrate their grievances. We are now in an era where we can make comments and give our opinions. Let's take one example. The national census that is to take place at the end of March. Almost all non-Burma ethnic nationals have expressed their concerns about the population census process assisted by the United Nations Population Fund. Most ethnic people in Myanmar the Kachin, Mon, Chin, Shan, Garan, and Yakin have expressed doubts about the validity of the government's official tally of 135 recognized ethnic groups. Many civil leaders see the census procedure as alienating and breaking up ethnic national identity, and many have made known their objections officially. It is encouraging to see how strong local NGOs' voices refuse to be undermined by an ill-considered program, however well-intentioned. A centrally controlled process without the full participation of and dialogue with all stakeholders should be avoided at all costs, especially in such a complex country like ours. 
Myanmar's current constitution is not inclusive, nor does the current initiative for peace lay out a clear plan to address the legitimate concerns of the co-founders of the union, the non-Burmans. The reality so far is this huge confiscation. It is not encouraging that amending this flawed constitution is in the hands of a hand-picked legislature, which is in no way a body representative of society as a whole. Currently, a government is pushing for a nationwide ceasefire that would lead to a peaceful settlement with the armed ethnic groups. Those of us who have doubts about the capacity and political will of the government's professed search for peace should consider ways and means of transforming conflict into lasting peace. Ceasefire are of no value unless transform into lasting peace. As for that to happen, civil society needs to be at the helm as the real owner of the process. Armies can agree to ceasefires between themselves, but they cannot make peace. Peace requires the people. We need to look at a comprehensive peace process that involves grassroots people and civil society, not just military and political leaders. A successful transformation will rely on the extent to which the communities are empowered and the support local organizations get. In other words, strengthening civil society and building peace are intertwined. I may be repeating myself, but I cannot stress enough how years of mismanagement by successive authoritarian governments and unabated armed conflicts have impacted Myanmar society and paralyzed them. There is no shortcut to reverse this, but the fact remains getting civilians to make their own choices and getting